We have a few more images from our own um, before we move on to St. Paul's. Uh, I, I just love this image too much not to share it. This is portrait of a peasant. Uh, this is the man's name is Patience, I believe. He was a shepherd, but we have a few images uh, by Van Gogh of him. But this one is really just a masterpiece. Uh, in my mind of, of modern art, again, when you look at this and you look at how he's flattened out certain aspects of the painting, the hat and his clothing, uh, but then other parts, the face, uh, and notably the hands holding the cane in almost a prayer-like fashion uh, uh, come jutting forward. And not only that, the areas that are flattened out, uh, they really, really have what's referred to as local color, just one color throughout. If we look at the uh, the, the yellow trapezoids uh, type uh, on top of his head there, uh, again, we really do project that as a hat, but it's, it's just a normal shape. Moving on to another one of my favorites, Avenue with Flowering Chestnut Trees at Arles. Uh, again, I love this because if you look at this, this is uh, so many different combinations of what we think of as uh, Van Gogh's style at the time. Uh, uh, again, if you look at how he's making the pavement uh, itself, and he's using the brushstrokes to almost make these paving stones, uh, and he's using the shadow of the tree to integrate this blue tone on top of the yellow tone, uh, it really is remarkable. And again, we have this entire variety of brush strokes. If we look at the trees, we see uh, a completely different idea of, 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 of application of paint. Uh, and then we move to the sky, we have these blue patches. Again, we look at the people, and, and this is obviously influenced uh, by the Japanese art he had. Uh, again, they're, they're, not, uh, they're almost unnoticeable. And we finally do move uh, on to saint Rome de provence uh, And again, this is the insane asylum that he stays in. Uh, during his time at St. Paul's Asylum, he completes more than 200 paintings. Uh, and again, this is a remarkable amount of work considering uh, he's in an insane asylum. And this is the old school idea of an insane asylum. There's, there's not a lot of uh, understanding of mental health whatsoever. Uh, I believe like in order to cure the patients, they would essentially give them very cold baths. That was their idea of mental health. Uh, and, and it is during this time that, you know, his mental health seems to be deteriorating more and more. Uh, he goes through periods where uh, he will have very, very crazy fits of hallucinations, uh, paranoid fits, all of these these type of things. Uh, and then he'll go through periods where he will essentially be, quote unquote, perfectly normal. And uh, it, it's during these periods, from my understanding, that uh, he is doing his painting. He's not painting uh, so much during these, these fits of hallucinations uh, uh, as, as sometimes is thought. Uh, when we look at the hospital itself, uh, again, we have uh, what, what essentially occurs is he stays there, and as he's there longer and longer, they give him a little bit more freedom. Uh, so we begin with kind of the interior of, of San, or, uh, San Paul uh, at San Rami, and then as we kind of continue his time there, we move farther and farther out into the garden uh, and, and, and the local environment, if you will. Uh, again, when we think of his time here, this is a, he's self-committed, uh, but again, we have to really put him in the environment uh, uh, that he's in. This is a very old school type of uh, mental asylum. Uh, interestingly enough, from Van Gogh, we actually have a very uh, detailed image of what the interior looks like. On the left, we have uh, the front door entrance. You almost could walk through that from the previous one. Uh, and then you could almost turn around and look down to one of these longer hallways that is present. Uh, again, we have a lot of work from him. And, and uh, uh, we, we know that he was using art as a, as a type of therapy uh, that, that in, uh, essentially he would in his own mind uh, could calm himself or relax himself more the more he worked on things. And, and again, uh, he thought that if he just continued to work that, that uh, a lot of his anxiety and, and mental disorders would be uh, uh, subset, if you will. Uh, again, we don't know 100% what was wrong with him. Uh, there's a lot of different debates about this. 
uh, again, when we look at images like prisoners exercising, uh, this is this is an image from the asylum, and, and we need to be uh, reminded that again, this is this is kind of the environment that he's in. It's it's as much a prison environment uh, as it is an asylum environment. But uh, again, what was wrong with Vincent Van Gogh? Uh, to me, I don't think you can put your one point at one thing and say that that's what was uh, the cause of all this. Again, we have to remember uh, he had a horrible lifestyle. He was very much addicted to absinthe. Uh, absinthe had horrible effects on your physical form, but also uh, your mind, it would deteriorate. Uh, it's very possible he could have had uh, a social disease. We, we know that earlier on in his life, it was thought that he had uh, gonorrhea and was treated for that while he was in Antwerp, uh, or excuse me, not in Antwerp, in The Hague. Uh, so again, it's very possible that could have been wrong as well. Uh, just uh, 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 to continue the thought, uh, it might. It has also been often argued that he might have had epilepsy, and again, there's a form of epilepsy that uh, kind of matches the pattern of his behavior. But uh, I think if you put all of these things together uh, into one one bag or one mind, that is Vincent Van Gogh, along with everything else, uh, this is most likely what was wrong. I don't think there was any one thing, uh, as much as a fine combination of uh, a number of things that would, would deteriorate you. Here we're looking at the sower uh, from 1888, and a lot of his early work that we see uh, from his time in the asylum, he's essentially copying other artists. This is after Millet, uh, and there's many, many works by Vincent van Gogh, by kind of his version of Millet paintings, and uh, one of the more famous ones we have from this kind of catalog is uh, the sower, and, and this is really his interpretation of, of the Millet uh, thematic of the peasants once again. But, you know, this amazing painting uh, uh, is, is ranked high in his catalog for good reason. If you look at the sun and the way it's exploding again, uh, Vincent trying to show us how light actually would reflect, and, and it forms around this bright, intense yellow orb of the sun. Uh, and as we move forward, we almost see like a frost uh, on the ground, but it is the setting sun, so this is dusk. Uh, we have these wonderful whites and blues where it almost looks like there's a snowfall. And when we put these two in comparison with each other, uh, in combination of, of the textures, again, and when we look at the three different textures there, uh, it, it's really amazing. Uh, irises from 1889, one of many uh, along this thematic. And again, if you look at kind of the intricacy of the of the of the work itself, uh, uh, this is one of these works that that we can think of as him using uh, as a method to essentially calm his troubled mind. Uh, again, these would be flowers he would see in and around. Uh, the asylum itself. Again, this very, very passionate blue color as we mix it down into these green tones. It's, it's a, a delightful uh, a combination. We even have little hints of turquoise uh, in the leaves as well. Uh, I love that when he does these studies uh, of very close color tones. Again, this is mostly just blues uh, and greens with just a little bit of red in the background uh, and just a hint of white to kind of set things off. Uh, if we look behind uh, the asylum itself, there's a large enclosed field. And again, we see a lot of these paintings around this enclosed field from different times, uh, uh, if you will. Again, when we look at the sun from this, this is always what I love about Van Gogh. Instead of uh, permeating out, almost shooting out now, in this sense, it's radiating out from the sun, uh, but still forming this wonderful circular pattern in comparison to the linear patterns we're seeing in the foreground. And again, uh, we can see the thick shadow that's cast uh, from the sun hitting the wall and, and moving across the field. Uh, as I mentioned, this, this field that we see uh, uh, is behind the asylum and we will continue to see different versions of this uh, in his work. Again, uh, uh, this is kind of a remote location, if you will. A meadow in the mountains. Again, uh, the, the, the intensity of that yellow in comparison to the blue is, is, is kind of remarkable. Uh, and this is all kind of work 
very much centered around the color yellow with, uh, you know, it's almost like the variations of the tone you can see. Uh, we have the sky with this incredible yellow uh, and this blue helping us accent that color. But then when we look at the rest of it, we have these greens, but throughout that green are different tones of yellow. And it's almost as if he's experimenting with how the yellow tone uh, from the sky is then integrating uh, down into the greens itself. And when we look at the greens, we have this entire range of colors uh, that we can see that he's actually experimenting with. We really do have more of a concentration or, or limit of subject matter again uh, because of the fact of his location there. Uh, the cypress trees, these are these famous trees that we see from Van Gogh and the Van Gogh swirl is in full effect, uh, not only in the trees, but he's also doing it within the sky itself. And again, these cypress trees must have just really helped him uh, find something that he could use to exercise these wonderful swirling organic forms that we associate uh, more with this kind of later period of his work. Uh, again, when we look at the sky in comparison to the trees and the thick swirls, uh, and, and again, there are actually two women that barely noticeable in the composition as well. Uh, but this is all leading towards the, the masterpiece that we know of uh, as, as Starry Night. When we look at these paintings, uh, they do kind of form this kind of trajectory towards what we think of. And again, Road with Cypresses is, is very much along that same kind of line. When we look at the sky, uh, we can even see aspects of Starry Night within this, this breaking up of color within the night sky and, and uh, uh, the investigation of how to actually represent how light radiates from things. And uh, of course, if you've looked up at a sky uh, uh, that is on a very, very clear night and you do see a very bright, brilliant moon, uh, you do see a, a, a radiating halo around it. Uh, and in, in this, we can imagine that this is as much uh, what Vincent is kind of trying for uh, with, with emblems like this as much as anything else. Uh, again, when we look at the sky, I start to see these patterns forming uh, that we, we would, of course, associate with uh, the painting that we will undoubtedly see next which is the, the starry night. Uh, and then in the foreground, we do have one of these wonderful cypress trees as well. Uh, we look at this, and, and this actually, uh, from my understanding, is, is a study uh, more than anything, that this is, this is Vincent van Gogh's attempt at, at not looking at nature and, and really just trying to create something within the capacity of his mind. Uh, he might not have even considered it a as good of a work as many of the other ones he was doing. Uh, but again, we see this, we see, see these swirls going through the sky that uh, we imagine as being clouds. And then we look at the moon uh, in this little shape that's almost cartoonish, but we see the light radiating across. It's as if the entire night itself uh, is this swirling uh, eddy and, and vortexing uh, sea rather than uh, what we would think of as the night. Along with Starry Night, uh, we look at sheaves of wheat uh, and we notice that there's kind of a change in, in the dynamic of his canvas. Towards the end of uh, his life and the end of his career, he adopts what's known as the double canvas, where he's essentially disassembling two of his earlier canvases, the stretcher bars, uh, and putting them back together in this more of a, of a longer rectangular fashion. Most of these, uh, I believe, are exactly 50 centimeters by 100 centimeters in length. Uh, again, a, a pretty standardized format, but a change uh, in terms of the dynamic of how he's painting. Uh, again, when we look at this and we look at how he's forming the sheets, uh, this is just about pattern as much as it's about any other aspect uh, of the work itself. Again, we have this brilliant, brilliant yellow. Uh, and as we look closer to the ground, we see that there's areas of absence uh, moving to the olive grove. And again, we see these uh, the Vincent van Gogh swirl. And, and in this, 
Uh, this is kind of interesting because we have the ground with these type of similar patterns uh, as they reach up into the olive trees, uh, up into the leaves, and then going out into the sky itself. Uh, it's almost as if he's doing one brush stroke throughout uh, that's just changing its color. But again, we get this hilarity from it. We get this feeling or this sensation uh, uh, of this fluidity throughout the entire scene uh, rather than just being isolated in the vegetation. Again, uh, towards the end here, we do see a, a change in how he's approaching the dynamic of the sky. Uh, I'm more used to these more flat patterns, almost like a, a brick wall, if you will.